Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Stephen Ruckman, Deputy Director of the SNF Agora Institute. For those of you who don't know us, we are an academic center and public forum at Johns Hopkins University that is dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of global democracy. We are really happy to be hosting today's discussion organized by Ivan Mawarire, our first SNF Agora RDI dissident in residence. Yvonne has invited Jamila Rakib, a specialist in the study and practice of strategic nonviolent action, and Joey Su, a Hong Kongese American human rights advocate, to join the conversation today. They will be sharing their experiences and ideas about how to turn moments that spark citizen outrage and protest into effective movements that bring about real change. For those of you who don't already know Yvonne's work, Yvonne Mabariri came to prominence in Zimbabwe as a clergyman and democracy activist who founded the hashtag This Flag Citizens Movement to challenge the brutal dictatorship of Robert Mugabe. For organizing protests and training citizens, he was imprisoned, tortured, and charged with treason. He now lives in the United States and is the Director for Education at the Renew Democracy Initiative, a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization whose aim is to strengthen democracy in America and globally. Jamila Rakib is the Executive Director of the Albert Einstein Institution which works to advance the research and application of nonviolent action worldwide. She focuses on the development and distribution of educational resources and has conducted workshops on strategic planning for human rights organizations, universities, governmental bodies, and other groups struggling for diverse objectives, including to oppose dictatorship and combat corruption and to attain political rights, economic justice, environmental protection, and women's empowerment. Joey Sue works at an international nonprofit, non government organization focused on international development, where she covers Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China's illiberal influence portfolios. She played a vital role in the Hong Kong pro democracy protests of 2019 and co founded the Hong Kong Higher Institutions International Affairs Delegation, a student coalition that led a cohesive effort in international advocacy for Hong Kong. Following escalating online physical harassment and threats, she fled Hong Kong in late 2020 and has settled in Washington, DC. It's an honor to have all of you with us, welcome. And, and now just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, our conversation will last for about an hour. Uh, Yvonne will lead a discussion among our panelists that will go for about 35 minutes, after which he will be taking questions from all of you. During the panel discussion, you can feel free to keep your camera on or off, but just please make sure your audio is muted. Uh, if you have questions for our panel, type them into the chat box. Uh, you can see the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. And if the question is chosen for discussion, I'll invite you to unmute, I'll call you by name, and you can pose your question directly to the panelists. Just a final note that SNF Agora welcomes and encourages a diversity of perspectives and opinions, but we do ask that all dialogue and behavior remain respectful and on topic. So with that, Ivan, I'll turn the conversation over to you. Stephen, thanks very much. I appreciate you setting us up and uh, hosting us. It's been a fantastic run at the SNF Agora Institute, where we've just been having conversations, particularly from my perspective, of you know how we can build better movements and you know how we can um, empower people more and more to be able to speak truth to power for those who are, particularly for those who are in authoritarian regimes, but also even people who are in free societies, just how important it is to remain engaged, how important it is to be able to uh, coalesce as citizens and take advantage of what, uh, you know, the freedoms that you have so that you can bring about uh, you know, a better system of governance or just better outcomes in terms of how we govern ourselves collectively. Um, you know, when we started the citizens movement in Zimbabwe, it started off really, uh, you know, by accident. And that's why this conversation for me is, is, a, is a pretty important conversation because we started something without knowing what we were starting. And even when we thought we had an idea of what it was, it, you know, it was, we were building the plane as it flew. And, and so we organized, you know, on, on Facebook, that was where it started. My first video that I recorded where it was a rant about the situation in Zimbabwe, the corruption, the injustice, the poverty, we had just gone through a horrible economic collapse in Zimbabwe. We had inflation rate running at like 286 million percent. 
You know, at one point we had, a, 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 you know, the largest banknote issued in Zimbabwe was a $100 trillion note. That's the largest legal banknote ever issued in the history of money. And, and so here we are going through again, the same thing in Zimbabwe when I started in 2016. And I record this four minute video where I'm really upset about what's happening in Zimbabwe. And I'm asking people, where are we? What, what do we have to say about it? And that sparks off this, this, this idea of maybe we can, we can get people together to speak truth to power. And uh, over the, the, the months that followed, the biggest actions we did were the protest. You know, we mobilized between you know, nine and 12 million people on our first protest. That was about four months after that first video, about four million, about nine million people to protest the government. And we were able to shut the entire country down by doing this. But that we didn't know that what we had ahead of us was a four year journey. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to learn from my uh, my 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 co-discussants uh, and those of you that are attending, how can we take advantage better of these moments, some of these moments are spontaneous. And that's why we call this from moment to movement, because we have these moments where citizens are inspired or citizens are outraged. How do we take that to, to becoming more sustainable, more effective, to give us a better impact than, uh, than either we imagined or than uh, you know, the moment uh, that we have? Because sometimes those moments disappear and, and we have missed opportunities. How do we have better, uh, better movements? So I'm looking forward to this discussion. And um, Joey, uh, you heard about Joey's uh, background. Joey, thank you for being with us and accepting the invitation. I've always been inspired by the work you did in Hong Kong. And I'll ask you to just tell us a little bit about that. And then we'll, we'll bring Jamila in and we'll start to have our conversation. Sure. So thank you so much, Yvonne, for having me. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Joey, and I currently work at an international nonprofit, non-governmental organization where I very much focus on international development and diaspora uh, development for the Hong Kong diaspora for Taiwan and also on issues related to China's liberal influence all around the world. And prior to coming to Washington DC and starting my current job, I was a student activist, student leader back in Hong Kong right before our 2019 pro-democracy movement started. I organized all these on-campus activities, including a citywide uh, boycott, a class boycott campaign. And I have also led a few large scale underground protests in Hong Kong. And aside from that, I also organized alongside other student activists and leaders, uh, this uh, student coalition where we organized and led cohesive uh, efforts uh, in regards to international advocacy for Hong Kong. And following the escalating physical harassment and also uh, police buying, I fled Hong Kong in late 2020 and came to Washington, D.C., where I worked at different diaspora organizations, continuing the advocacy that we have uh, began in 2019 for international attention on Hong Kong. And aside from uh, working on Hong Kong specifically, after I went into exile, I have also increasingly worked on building cross-movement solidarities between the Hong Kong diaspora community alongside Tibetans, Uyghurs, and all other communities uh, under the same oppression of the Chinese Communist Party. And aside from that, we have also been very much focused on currently uh, observing, researching, analyzing, and also working to counter the escalating transnational repression coming from the People's Republic of China. So with that being said, I think what Ivan mentioned about the Zimbabwe um, movement, it was really inspiring to hear. And of course, I find a lot of similarity between the Zimbabwe movement and also the Hong Kong movement. Very similarly for the Hong Kong movement, it also began with a few singular protests that were planned very abruptly without a very uh, well planning, a very well thought organizing behind that. And because of the oppressions that the government has been imposing on us and because of the uh, corresponding oppression and, uh, and repression that we have been receiving, it turned into this sustainable movement where we still up until today are still developing and also carrying on overseas in diaspora. And I think when we talk about the sustainability and also how 
Hong Kong singular underground protests and confrontation with police brutality, government oppression turned into this very, very long term diaspora movement that is still developing right, right, right now. I think it is very, very important for us to look into the uh, to the utilization of the Hong Kong protester in regards to technology and social media, because at the very beginning of our movement, it really started at this very localized, very underground grassroots organizing. But then with the Hong Kong protesters' utilization of social media and also our strategy in terms of building coalitions and actively expanding our outreach to different communities and international stakeholders, we are able to turn this singular effort into a consistent movement that is still developing and expanding. And I look forward to discussing uh, the rationales behind this and analyzing the reasons behind this with Jamila and also Yvonne. Thanks, thanks a ton, Joey. Um, Jamila, um, your, 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 your work and background has largely over the years included, you know, studying movements like ours, um, you know, studying these moments where we start, um, you know, and I know that, you know, all the work that you developed, work that you developed as well with Gene Sharp, who, uh, you know, the late Gene Sharp, who is literally, you know, one of the standard voices that people like myself uh, will read and you know, kind of stock up on everything that he taught on creating nonviolent movements. Uh, all of that work has gone into researching movements like ours. Would you just, as you come in, give us kind of a high level of what your findings have been about these movements and these moments that take place? I mean, I'm even thinking back to uh, the Arab Spring and how that began with that one you know, street vendor who lit himself on fire and suddenly this thing erupted. Just walk us through about, uh, you know, what your work with movements like ours tell you uh, about crisis moments that can be turned into, into these sustainable movements. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Yvonne and Joey and everyone joining us today. Uh, I just want to also start by thanking Agorans too for organizing this discussion uh, about how to transform uh, moments of mass mobilization into, into sustainable movements. It's a really important question that you ask, Yvonne, and that, and that we're discussing here today. And I'm glad we're reflecting on this uh, because we know that achieving the kind of real and lasting change that we really need in our societies takes more than just you know momentary displays of uh, anger and dissatisfaction. Um, we're seeing this reflected in our world today and among the movements that that we're observing and that we're that we're working with, right? Because these moments of crisis, when there's these moments of outrage, like the, like like what you described, Yvonne. I mean, these are moments of crisis. They're also moments of opportunity. There are moments of hope for many people. Uh, you know, the injustice of a system is made visible. People are fired up. Um, and, and it seems like there's a moment where, you know, democratic change seems finally within people's grasp. Um, but unfortunately, we see different things happening in that in that moment. Um, movement leaders and participants sometimes let down their guard because this initial show of power makes it seem like victory is inevitable. Uh, but then we see these movements either collapse because of repression, uh, or they could uh, kind of turn to, to turn to violence, um, or they simply you know lose steam and, and, and fizzle out, uh, and, and they fail to achieve the kind of uh, uh, democratic outcomes that people had hoped for at least in the short term. So I remember speaking with a, a, a Lebanese activist during the 2019 uprising. Uh, so she was describing the situation, weeks of protests had basically brought the country to a standstill and the like economic uh, strikes were, you know, had uh, paralyzed the economy. Um, and at that point, the president had just resigned. And she said, you know, with this like, hopefulness, almost euphoria, it's over, you know, we won. Um, the system couldn't withstand our demands for change. People are pissed off, uh, they're showing it. And, uh, and and the system has has granted us what we want. We want, right? But unfortunately, that change was fleeting, and their struggle is far from over. So, you know, in in thinking about and reflecting on what to share today, I think first and foremost is to resist this feeling of inevitability. You know that people sometimes get swept up in during these moments of mass mobilization. Um, we have to resist the idea that just you know, if enough people demand change, that that in itself is enough to produce the change. Uh, we have to resist the idea that protests, demonstrations, demonstrations and marches, you know, what are essentially symbolic displays of dissatisfaction that on their own, uh, they're strong enough to force, you know, these entrenched systems 
to grant people's demands. Um, these symbolic actions are just one step in achieving, you know, real durable change. A lot needs to happen before. Joey just described, you know, the Hong Kong case was seen as this kind of magical thing where people just poured out into the street. But in fact, it was built on probably decades of organizing. Uh, and I think we need to remember that, that this period of capacity building, institution building, you know, training that precedes these moments have a lot to do when we see effective movements, but it's the part of the movement that's very difficult to capture by the media. So sometimes we think they're, they're more spontaneous than in fact they are. So this is sort of what we work on at the Albert Einstein Institution. We think about movement effectiveness and sustainability, what kind of advanced planning and preparation and capacity building can help uh, prepare for these movements, because these movements, the, these moments, excuse me, these moments are inevitable. Crisis moments are inevitable in every one of our societies. We need to you know, like engage citizenry that understands their rights and, and what to do about them, uh, you know, if those rights are violated. Uh, as you can tell, I have a lot to say about this, and, and there, there's a lot more to it, but, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I want to come, we're going to come back to this, because you're, you're talking about stuff, and I have to share this by, by way of you know, just drawing from my own story, um, you know, you're, you're, some of the things you're mentioning are things that I certainly saw uh, on the way or saw in hindsight uh, that we should have either done this or we shouldn't have done that. But part of the pressure, obviously, that you're dealing with when, you're, when you spark a movement or when you find yourself at the forefront of leading a movement is this demand by the masses for action um, you know, and then, of course, you know, there's this demand by the media as well for, uh, you know, so where's this going next? And, you know, where, where's the big, big thing happening next? And, you know, those are some of the pressures that I know that I faced. And because of that, there was very little time that we wanted to commit to sitting down and planning. And I also have to admit is that a lot of people like myself, who, who find themselves leading or, or, or sparking these movements, you know, we, you know, we sort of, we sort of also just don't, don't, don't really like just sitting down to plan. We want to be out there on the street, making it happen. But I want to probably just start with the question of leadership. Joey, you and I had a conversation some time ago when we were kind of comparing notes and we were talking about leadership and what you guys did in the Hong Kong uh, you know, protest in terms of how those were led. Um, do you mind just walking us through how you guys structured the leadership? Was it just centered around one person? You know, was there centrality to it, or did you did you kind of do something else as you as you began to set out how the the, the protest and the movement would be led? That's a very great question, Yvonne. I think whenever we look at the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong since 2019, or even when we look at the Hong Kong's diaspora movement right now, we of course sometimes will see all these big names like Nathan Law, Joshua Wong, appearing on different, uh, on different media's headlines or everywhere else. But then when you really look deep into our movement and organizing of Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement and all these underground protests in Hong Kong, you can see that it was really a leaderless movement. Leaderless is a principle that we have been advocating for and have been trying our very best to adhere to ever since the movement broke out in 2019. If some of you have uh, paid attention to the organizing or the uh, civil disobedience history in Hong Kong, you would realize that back in 2014, we had this umbrella revolution where a few very, very prominent, very, very eye-catching student leaders led this occupation when uh, at one of Hong Kong's uh, busiest uh, business districts and uh, central districts. And then you can see that what we faced at that time was that when the government issues or implements targeted oppression and persecution on these specific leaders uh, who have been organizing, taking the leading role of, um, of organizing all these large scale occupation and movements, you see that whenever they are placed into danger or at a risk of being persecuted, arrested, you see that the, you see that the, the, the mass um, protesters in Hong Kong face a situation where we lose the leader who would be able to continue to guide us into the situation. So taking lessons from our 2014 umbrella revolution, we really realized that the best way to um, 
the best way to stand up to the Chinese government or the Hong Kong government to avoid similar situations from happening again. We need to make sure that there is no way or there is no one person that would be able to um, be in place into that danger, and then that would lead to a that would lead to a crackdown of the whole motivation of um, the pro democracy actors who are involved in, in this movement. So what we did back in two thousand and nineteen was that we continuously, we consistently emphasized the leaderless strategy, where we do not abide by one uh, specific pro democracy activist or leaders. Uh, decisions. We try to mobilize every single individual in Hong Kong. We try to make good use of every single one's, um, of every single individual's ability. For example, um, back in Hong Kong, you see uh, protests and also movements happening every single day all across uh, the different districts in Hong Kong. What we did is that we do not have one leading organization or one leading individual organizing these protests or uh, activities. We mobilize every single anonymous individual to organize this on uh, different online social media platforms. We try to mobilize our different units of institutions and organizations to conduct activities to the best of our ability in different forms. And I think that the leaderless uh, principle that we have been adhering to really helped us turn our protest that broke out overnight into a sustainable movement where we no longer face um, that high level of a danger or risk where we face a situation of having our leader arrested and then the whole movement cracked down. And because that we do not have any leader in a sense that everyone is a leader in their own ways. And with that, even though the mass uh, political persecutions continue to happen in Hong Kong up until these days, we see that all these prominent leading pro-democracy activists are uh, being arrested and jailed in Hong Kong right now. But then even with that happening, we still see because of the experience and the leadership principle that we have been adapting to since 2019, you see our you still see our movement growing so vibrantly overseas and in diaspora. And I think that is a really valuable lesson uh, where we can where we can take from the Hong Kong movement. I must I must say I have to admit with with, a, with again drawing from my own story as I led the movement in Zimbabwe that I found it very difficult to um, um, you know kind of get get this concept of a leaderless movement uh you know going um although the value of it became very apparent um because of the things you're talking about where when the leader is then arrested as i was uh, on multiple you know at multiple times the, the the movement seems to kind of either take a hit or sometimes i have to also admit that the arrest of myself as the leader uh, as the leader or the symbolic leader uh, would actually cause the movement to grow even more. And, um, uh, you know, I think that struggle between being, okay, so I started it, do I have to necessarily lead it? Um, although, you know, people feel like, no, you are maybe not the leader, you're definitely the symbolic uh, you know, kind of person for for this for this movement. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that I kind of saw. And I want to ask Jamila uh, because I I'm quite certain that this is an aspect that you have studied and an aspect that you also teach on when you do a lot of training. Would you tell us a little bit about the findings and the kind of thoughts and the kind of you know uh, um, uh, the, the, the 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 learnings around this leaderless. Um, or this decentralized leadership uh, system for 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 you know for kind of leading the the movement forward. Yeah, it's such an important question, and uh, I think this concept of leaderless movements is. I think reflects the nature of movements today, right? It, it, it reflects the nature of leadership in movements today. And it's not necessarily like Joey said that there are no leaders. It's actually maybe they're not visible. Maybe there's many of them and it doesn't take the form of a single charismatic leader. Like sometimes we attribute nonviolent action to a King or a Gandhi. But in fact, even in the struggles of the past, they were often sometimes behind the scenes people, you know, councils like, essentially systems for decision making and leadership to design tactics and, and, and kind of guide people to, to convey vision, things like that. So those needs are being met in very, very different uh, ways today. Uh, and I think that what we need to remember is that as movements are sort of 
decentralized, uh, they still need to be coordinated and strategic, and they still need to carry out action in line with a common vision, right, and a set of objectives. And we're seeing that in, in you know, a question in, in, in the chat as well about how do you stay aligned given decentralization? And so it is a very, very uh, important question for, uh, for, for us to kind of uh, uh, reflect on. Um, so if we're talking about leadership as, as existing across kind of loose networks, of, of, of people, they need to be empowered to act as individual leaders, right, to make decisions for the movement. And, and for that, they need, you know, access to information. Uh, they need access to training. Um, and they need, you know, uh, a, a movement that enables them to do that and access to communication. And so I, I guess when I say coordination, you know, I don't mean centralization. We're talking here not about coordination in the classical sense where any single group kind of decides strategy and everyone follows. So Again, I think central to this is the need for, for a clear and inclusive vision, uh, one that reflects as many groups as possible, uh, that acts as a North Star for the movement, you know, a sort of endpoint uh, from which people People can kind of reverse engineer strategies and tactics. Uh, and, and I think central to this, again, is the is access to educational resources, guidelines, so that people can kind of design and carry out action. Uh, in, in some societies, this has meant uh, handbooks, uh, training resources, uh, lists of do's and don'ts, uh, and other ways in which people can kind of figure out what to do and how they can advance a movement's goals if there is no sort of centralized structure for decision making. Right. So we've and, and, and I think you've brought up some really important points here, the idea of uh, a North Star, the idea of a vision. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, as we grapple with these kind of beginnings of a moment, um, you know, it's important to get in there quickly and start to formulate a vision around it. Um, and I think because part of what we've seen is that sometimes people mistake uh, protests for movements. Um, and, I, and, and I could be wrong, so I'm, I'm going to draw on both of you here in that there's a difference between having a movement and, and having a series of protests or having a, ser a series of spontaneous, you know, protests. Um, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll ask Joey first and then I'm gonna come, I'll, I'm gonna ask you, Jamila, to come in with kind of like the preparation and the plan, just leading us through some of the important building block to move us from this moment to a point where we can say, right, we have a movement now. So I'll ask you to prepare for that. Joey, one of the things that the Hong Kong protest movement did very well was to utilize social media to, to onboard people um, and to utilize social media, I guess, to, um, to work with the international uh, you know, community you know, in this. And the question um, that I have is, how did that shape the movement on the ground? These different, these different kind of interactions or outreaches that you had. I mean, even now you spoke earlier on about how the Hong Kong protest movement has a very vibrant international uh, presence, uh, you know. Would you just talk to us about how that shaped, how, 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 how the, 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 the social media interactions internationally shaped the movement on the ground in terms of as it was growing and becoming more than just protests and becoming a movement? I think Jamila uh, just now mentioned the importance for a leaderless movement and decentralized movements, uh, the importance of uh, access to communication platforms, and also the ability for us to empower individuals to become uh, individual leaders within the whole movement. And I felt like for uh, taking the Hong Kong movement as an example, social media really played a, a very, very significant role in terms of ensuring that access to communication, access to coordination, and also access to empowerment and capacity building to individual leaders, and also in terms to shaping our protests, our singular uh, momentary protests into a sustainable um, internationally known movement that we see right now. And I think in terms of how the Hong Kong protesters utilize social media to 
ensure or contribute to the sustainability of our movement. I think, I think it really contributed in three ways. So first I would say in terms of width, um, you can see that since 2019, the Hong Kong protester really uh, coordinated and organized a dispersed effort to conduct outreach and also to promote our social movement on different multiple social media platforms. We see that uh, we have been utilizing platforms, of course, like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter to reach international audiences that might have not heard about Hong Kong, might are, uh, that are not aware of situations in Hong Kong. And at the same time, you also see Hong Kong protesters mobilizing other platforms like WhatsApp or Telegram to reach out to individuals who are inside of Hong Kong who are aware of the political dynamics going on in the city, but then are not as familiar with the pro-democracy movement that is happening. And I think the dispersed efforts and also uh, tailored effort on multiple social platforms, so, so, um, multiple social media platforms really, uh, really enabled us to uh, reach individuals in Hong Kong from all walks of life, from different age groups, uh, various uh, occupations and different uh, educational backgrounds. But then at the same time, you also see these protesters um, translating our protest materials into different languages. You see these protesters localizing the information about Hong Kong's uh, movement into, um, into information and also into materials that will attract uh, attention from other groups. So for example, in Hong Kong, we have our pro-democracy movement and we have been localizing our knowledge and experiences learned from our movement too. Uh, we made this um, protest handbook and uh, toolkit for protesters in Thailand at that time who were also organizing their own movement. And these kind of localization of protest materials on different social media platforms really allowed us to build um, instant connections and form allyships with different other international communities, uh, oppressed uh, oppressed people who are also organizing their movements, which really expanded the width of, of our uh, of our movement. And secondly, I would say it also enhanced the depth of our movement. We see that the utilization of social media platforms uh, as an open space for discussion. We had a lot of brainstorming of strategies that we employed during the protests, which are of a shorter term. And at the same time, we also see people initiating these intellectual debates and discussions in regards to the long-term future of Hong Kong, the roots and also the way ahead for Hong Kong's movements. And I think one thing that Ivan and also Jamila, you also mentioned that is that very often when these protests happen, it happened in a very abrupt way, which are often organized uh, overnight in a very hasty manner, driven by momentary emotions of anger, sadness, or even hope or motivation to, uh, to demand change. But then I really think that these kind of utilization of social media platforms as an open space for discussion really allowed us to build the intellectual and academic base um, that explains our rationales and they also consolidated the credibility as well as legitimacy of our movement that allowed us to carry on this conversation in different spaces for a longer term. Mm. And last but not least, I also think that the utilization of social media platforms in Hong Kong also allowed us to transform our uh, momentary singular protest into a long-term sustainable movement that had a longer longevity. As we see Hong Kong becomes this rapidly closing uh, space after the mass political persecutions and also the implementation of the Draconian National Security Law, which led to the imprisonment of uh, our city's most prominent pro-democracy voices. We see that with the utilization of social media platforms, we're able to continue to uh, pass on the allyship that we built, to pass on the knowledge and also to pertain the history of our movement. And with that being said, I would say those are the effects that we have seen of social media in regards to transforming our protests into a sustainable movement. Oh, powerful stuff, uh, Joey. Um, Jamila, I, I'm, I'm coming to you now with what I kind of prompted you on earlier. You know, the necessary building blocks. We've spoken here about, uh, you know, the moment happens, you, you spoke about vision, you spoke about North Star, I like that idea, the North Star you know, that, that which is giving us direction. We spoke a little bit about planning and training. Uh, you know, would you walk us through kind of like the necessary building blocks, right? So, 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 you know, what comes next? What are the key things that we've got to do as we are now getting to a place where we're saying, 
we have a movement or a place where we're saying this is a vehicle now that is lasting beyond the moment and that is able to provide leadership, is able to provide an alternative way of participation for, you know, for people in a community. Yeah, thank you. And I think I, I want to comment also on what Joey said. It's so it's so interesting because, you know, if we observe the, the role of technology and social media kind of in the movement space, you know, around the Arab Spring, there was this euphoria that, you know, technology is going to solve all of our problems. And then there was this, OK, well, actually, these, these tools are available to the opponents and they have a very complicating effect. Uh, and it's very interesting to hear hear what Joey's saying about how it's, uh, you know, contributed to movement sustainability in the case of in the case of Hong Kong. Because a lot of what, you know, we're hearing is that, you know, the social media and the technology is, you know, reducing the cost of organizing. It's in, you know, it's increasing global engagement on all kinds of issues, all these mobilizations that are enabled by social media, like what you described, Yvonne, with, you know, making this making this video and then suddenly it's sparking a movement of, of thousands of people participating. Participating. Um, so obviously, these tools have changed the changed the sort of so called battlefield because it's ma made it easier for people to to get on the street. Uh, but it's also allowing groups to skip over some of these very very fundamental steps that make movements sustainable, right? That that can do more than just protest uh, and create these momentary disruptions um, that can actually win uh, concrete victories and then also defend those victories, right? Because it's not just about bringing down an oppressive system. It's also about how do we transition into a, into a democratic system. And, mm. and I think fundamental to everything that we're talking about is really the need to build uh, power, right? Power not just to disrupt, uh, but to build alternative institutions. So when you're talking about a step by step, you know, obviously, there's no kind of neat row of buttons that we can press as as uh, Martin Luther King said, uh, you know, to, to produce the movement or the outcome that we want. Um, but I think understanding power and, and how to get it is is really key to all of this and understanding that, you know, uh, we need institutions, we need organizations, we need networks of people, we need capacity. Um, and this is a fundamental part of movement building, you know, going back even to, to Gandhi uh, and the Indian independence movement and earlier, because as disruption and non-cooperation by a movement, you know, weakens uh, oppressive structures, the movement, uh, you know, has to create new institutions to take its place. Um, and so this is the kind of advanced planning that we're, that we're referring to, um, you know, cooperation, uh, mutual aid to preserve social order, to meet people's needs. Um, you know, we saw an example of this. Uh, we, we're seeing a lot of examples of this throughout the world, especially during the pandemic, but in the anti-coup protests in in Sudan, the neighborhood committees that were established not only to organize protests and strikes, but also, uh, you know, to distribute, uh, uh, to provide for security, to, to distribute uh, food and medicine, equipment, to dig wells, you know, to clean streets. I know uh, that movement in Hong Kong did a lot of that sort of thing. And it does so much to kind of address this narrative that people are about bringing down a system, that they're not about governance and democracy and human rights. And it's, I think, really, really important on the narrative perspective, but also in terms of building institutions that can do resistance, but then also can meet other needs. And, you know, uh, Jenny uh, Vakadava was was great, you know, in, in, in Bolivia during during the Amazon fires and the way that she kind of pivoted her resistance organization to deal with the, the forest fires. Um, and, you know, we have lots of examples of this going back to the Montgomery bus boycott. You know, the, the, the boycott lasted 380 some days because there was a very sophisticated carpool system uh, to get people to work and to get people to where they needed to go. So when we think about sustainability, when we think about power, uh, then clearly building alternative ways to meet people's needs is becomes extremely important. And so I think, you know, doing it, unfortunately, you know, Yvonne, you said earlier that people don't necessarily want to sit down and do analysis in the midst of a struggle. And, and we get that. Maybe not everyone has to be engaged in that, but someone does or some people do, right? We do need some information about sources of power that maintain the system? What are the institutions that provide various sources of support, cooperation and obedience that allow these systems to function? That analysis allows us to target our own actions in ways you know, that can be truly efficient, that can use the power we have for maximum efficiency. Without that, 
you know, you're having sporadic actions here and there that are incredibly brave, but are not necessarily strategic. So yeah. I think initial analysis is extremely important. There are specific tools to help people do that. We're working on one. Uh, and, 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 and then, you know, and then understanding the different methods available. You know, Gene Sharp had this 198 methods of nonviolent action. And obviously that list has grown to include thousands of methods that are just mm -hmm. fueled by human imagination and creativity and new technology and things like that. So understanding what's the repertoire of action. So we understand it's not simply just to go in the streets. Uh, but maybe there are things that are actually more powerful uh, that use the power you have and, and essentially a more strategic right. way right. and potentially, uh, uh, yeah, more effective. Uh, so this is what we mean by strategy and the, and the need to, have, to develop that in advance. Well, here's what I'm going to do is we're because we're, we're we're moving into the last segment of um, our talk today where we um uh, you know, kind of get questions and interactions from those that are attending with us here today. And thank you for every one of you who's come through today, uh, just to kind of you know listen in or you know you know give us give us some uh, you know some feedback or, or questions uh, to help us shape this conversation. And I can already see I, I saw a comment that someone made earlier on that struck me when we were talking about the leaderless uh, movement, and uh, uh, someone said leaderful instead of leaderless. Uh, because really what we're doing is we're filling the movement with leaders. And so this idea of decentralizing the leadership is actually a leader full, uh, you know, creating a leader full, uh, you know, movement. So I like that. Someone early on spoke about going from moment to movement to new institutions and building new institutions out of uh, out of that. So that's already some great interaction. Uh, Stephen uh, Ruckman uh, from the SNF Agora, you're going to help us with the questions now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it back to you and uh, help us to to take the questions that you've seen come up in the feed. Yeah, Lena, lots of great questions coming in. Thank you, everybody. And uh, and thanks for the thoughtful comments that have been shared. A couple of questions have been answered already in the conversation. So I'm going to be looking for ones that add new dimensions. Um, let's start with Camille Furtado. Camille, you had a question for, for, for Joey about how to empower leaders. You can unmute. Yeah, too late. Oh, thanks. Hi. Um, I've, I've got two questions. Um, so the first one that I put in the chat was like, um, yeah, how I think a couple of you talked about training um, and resources for for movements as well. But how do you um, empower leaders and encourage people to tap into their own leadership qualities in your context, Joey? Um, how are people supported to sort of step up? Um, that's my first question. I'm going to be cheeky and ask another one. Um, how do traditional um, or what role can traditional sort of philanthropic organizations play in um, supporting uh, uh, movements, you know, once they're building these new institutions and they're moving to um, moving from moment to to um, to movement? Uh, what does the panel see as the role of sort of funders in that space? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So I would take the first one. I, I would defer the second one to our expert here, Jamila. So I think throughout the conversation, I have really put a lot of emphasis into the uh, abrupt, um, the, the, the very abrupt nature of Hong Kong's protest that turned into a sustainable movement right now. But I also wanted to echo to what Jamila has been talking about through our conversation that none of these protests, although it might seem erupt or organized overnight, there has been a lot of uh, preparation efforts and steps that have been going uh, that have been going on behind the scenes uh, prior to these uh, erupt protests that happened. So I think in the context of Hong Kong, when we look at these protests back in 2019, which turned to nowadays sustainable movements, I think it's also very important to realize the fact that right before 2019, for a very, very long time, Hong Kong has been uh, a city where we have this very, very vibrant society. We know that for the case of um, the People's Republic of China, um, we know that civil society has been closed uh, in China for many, many years. And one of the ways that many international stakeholders has been lending humanitarian assistance and also democracy assistance 
to human rights advocates, in, including uh, human rights lawyers or LGBTQ activists or feminist organizers in China is through Hong Kong. And for many, many years in Hong Kong, we have all these very vibrant, very effective civil society organizations and stakeholders increasing their capacity through putting these uh, skills into practices, lending assistance and using Hong Kong as this, uh, as this spot and also uh, intersection to provide assistance to, to, to mainland China. And I feel like all these prior ex experiences really prepared um, the civil society in Hong Kong to become these effective leaders and also stakeholders into turning our uh, very abrupt protest into a more sustainable movement. Of course, the movement at uh, the protest that happened in Hong Kong overnight really uh, act as an emotional calling that mobilized a lot of these um, stakeholders who might have gone rather low profile over the years, over the government's continuous and uh, slowly escalating oppression towards the society. But then I would say these preparations that has been going behind the scenes, these capacity building uh, actions and steps that has been going behind the scenes really served as a very crucial step that prepared uh, the Hong Kong protesters into becoming stakeholders that are able to turn this protest into a more sustainable movement. And just in regards to your question on how we uh, empowered uh, every single protesters in Hong Kong to become a, a, a leader in their own ways. I think, as I have mentioned, social media really played a very, very crucial role. We talked about how sometimes we uh, emphasize on the importance of having a very charismatic a singular leader who would be able to stand out, who would be able to serve as this leading voice that provides strategies and guidance to our whole movement. But then I would say the utilization of social media platform really allowed us to uh, get rid of those kind of bias that we might have when we are interacting with one another to get rid of that, uh, that, that, that tendency of us to uh, abide by the uh, instructions or strategies provided by more well-known individuals or well uh, or more charismatic individuals. And I think really the social media's uh, presence in Hong Kong's um, pro-democracy movement really allowed us to, um, without a kind of bias, to utilize our best abilities and to utilize our own skills in our own ways to serve as an anonymous organizer and to become a leader in our own ways throughout the protest. Thank you so much, Joey. There, there, oh, sorry, Jamila, did you want to weigh in? Actually, I was just going to comment on the on the issue of of uh, you know what can what can foundations or philanthropic organizations do to support movements. I think there's a lot of very interesting work uh, uh, done more recently uh, by International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and and Hardy Merriman and others on really what types of external support is useful to movements. I think first and foremost we do need to understand that nonviolent resistance is a is a is a phenomenon that's having great impact in the world, and it does need to be included in 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 our understanding of uh, you know. Know, uh, of the type of work to support. Um, so including it as an area of funding, I think is extremely important. And then ultimately, I think what we found is that really the capacity building, skills building, providing kind of spaces for organizing becomes very important uh, because you know the, the, the space to think and plan is not a given in many different societies. Uh, and so uh, supporting that I think is, is, is important. Uh, we also know that's very costly to do that. It's very risky to do that in many cases, it's not very scalable, right, to kind of fly people out of the country and have so-called outside experts. And, and we don't know necessarily that that's, you know, the most empowering way to do it either. So I think there's a lot of questions in here, here about really what is the best way to support. Uh, but I think in terms of the decentralized movements, I think we need to we need to understand there is an education and a capacity gap right now uh, and, and think very deeply about, about how to fill that in ways that are truly empowering, that recognize the agency of these groups that don't that don't involve you know costly efforts to to fly outside experts i think there's a lot of wisdom in the communities but it needs to be blended with sort of our collective knowledge about how movements work and what makes them succeed and fail and we need to do better on producing those resources thank you so much jamila we we have a question from paul andrews about leadership in exile uh, yvonne and joey you um paul do you want to unmute and, and ask your question So uh, often it's necessary for the leaders of a resistance to go abroad so they won't be arrested 
Um, how does their being out of the country affect their ability to uh, influence events? Um, I'll jump in and weigh in on that. And, and first of all, it's a really good question because that's pretty much my situation is, you know, after, you know, kind of four years of being on the ground and having been arrested over eight times and spent time in the maximum security prison, it just becomes unsustainable, uh, you know, to be on the ground. Physically, there's only so much you can take. And I think one of the things that we've then seen is that when people have have really stuck to the idea of I'm going to stay on the ground no matter what it takes, Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes we have, didn't have the outcome where people's lives are taken. And there, there is a place for martyrdom. I think we've seen how powerful that can be. But I want to say that it's not always necessary. And um, um, in my case, I chose that instead of losing my life for it, I want to be able to remain to be not only alive, but to be healthy so that I can continue contributing in, in, you know, you know, to the movement. And the only way to do that is to be in exile. So how to do it? First of all, it's not easy. It's tough because you, you, you're, you're, you're dealing with the fact that the people in your movement themselves are thinking about how easy it is now for you to speak because you are out, but they have to carry out the vision that you are advocating for. Or they have to carry out that which the plan that you have all put together, uh, they are on the ground. So that, that is kind of you know difficult to deal with. But being in exile then allows you a whole new set of opportunities in terms of not only growing the movement, but in terms of achieving certain objectives. So uh, for example, you are able to advocate a lot more with uh, you know, other um, uh, uh, movements or with certain you know, um, uh, governments that are pro your movement or pro democracy in terms of legislation, in terms of you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, getting them to understand what really is happening on the ground. So for example, for, some, for those of us who are here in the US, it has been a great opportunity to be able to go Go and engage legislators, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., about the issue that we have in Zimbabwe or the issues that we have in Zimbabwe. It's been an awesome opportunity to engage uh, those with resources and do so freely because it is illegal. And I'm trying to tie in the question that was brought in about, uh, you know, you know, philanthropy uh, help and funders. In many countries, it's illegal to receive help for civic society organizations from, you know, that are not approved by the government. You can get into trouble for that. And that was one of the issues we ran into on the ground. And so we were often afraid to receive any sort of help from anyone outside because immediately the government would brand us as working with regime change agenda agents from particularly in this case from the West. Um, and so we were shy to receive any, any, any help for a long time and that hurt us. And I think that's again, part of, I think uh, one of the things that's important for building uh, movements that are sustainable is to have not just uh, funding, but to have the right kind of funding that comes in and for leaders of these movements to accept that it's okay to receive this kind of help because you cannot build a sustainable movement without resources uh, you know of that uh, you know of that nature so 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 it is difficult in exile but one of the big things is to be able to find the solidarity of people in a na in the nation mm -hmm. that you now live in to also be part of your movement to understand what's happening in your movement and to lend you that support I would just like, like to add on very, very quickly. I think I fully echo to what Ivan has said in terms of the unexplored opportunities and also resources that could help us sustain our movement in diaspora. But then at the same time, uh, to me, I would say going into exile, of course, it guaranteed my ability to continue to stay in this movement in a more sustainable way without the risk of political persecution or being imprisoned. However, it has also come to my recognition that when we go into exile, we're also facing a lot of unfamiliar challenges that we would not, in other case, would have faced when we are still on the ground in Hong Kong. For example, in Hong Kong, because that our movement is so leaderless and decentralized, we have been emphasizing the fact that every single person could be a leader in their own ways and organize their own activities, um, and then also to protest to defend Hong Kong in their very own ways. But then the cases when we go into exile, 
unlike the unlimited room for us to protest or to be a leader in our own ways on the ground, when we go into exile, we face very often the situation where we have to compete with each other for the very limited resources that we are receiving from other governments, from international stakeholders. There will be intensifying intra-community dynamics that we have to resolve or otherwise it will be impacting our community's future, the development of our diaspora community very, very significantly. And these are some of the limitations that to be honest, me myself as a newly exiled Hong Kong activist is still struggling to reflect and find a solution on uh, in, in, in uh, currently. And at the same time, I think this also relates to the question of what international community or what international stakeholders could do to support our movements and that are currently in exile or still in development. I think when we are back in Hong Kong or uh, when we are back on the ground, when we are engaging in these protests and movements, very often we are very much focused on the organizing, the participation in these activities. While when in when us are in exile, we also still are very driven by all these emotions of the guilt that we have as a person that is now in a free country that can advocate safely without having to worry about persecution, etc. But then very often because that we are so focused Focus on these emotional driven motivations to conduct advocacy, to advocate for our people who are still on the ground. We often neglect the need and also necessity for us to focus also on the area, the aspect of building our capacity to allow us to continue to conduct more effective and sustainable advocacy. So I think before international stakeholders think about uh, what they can do to build the capacities of these diaspora communities and to build the capacities of these stakeholders who are engaging in the movements. I think it is also utterly important for international stakeholders to really help uh, stakeholders and actors in these movements to realize the importance of engaging in capacity building activities to ensure a more sustainable movement in the long term. We're, we're about out of time, unfortunately, even though there's a lot of other questions coming in. I, I'll, I'm going to just try to quickly ask one more question that, that was in the chat from, from Sarah Shore, which is who she works at a faith-based climate justice organization and asks how you all think religion has played a role, positive or negative, in, in these movements. Do you want to take a quick second and then we can wrap up? Yeah, I, I, I think maybe I, I might be um, uh, more suited to answer that question. Um, starting off as a pastor, I, I think, you know, for, for Zimbabwe, again, which is considered in terms of the religion, the dominant religion, uh, which is Christianity, is probably about 70, some say 80 percent Christian, just in terms of influence, not so much that everyone practices it, but just in terms of influence. Uh, it's, it's about between 70 and 80 percent. And so beginning with that, uh, um, the values of, of, of our faith as the basis for building the movement really helped in terms of people identifying with the movement. And when I say the values, I'm talking about universal values of our faith that also align with values of democracy and that align with values of human rights and you know and freedom. So we're talking about compassion, we're talking about transparency, we're talking about justice and mercy. Uh, you know, it really helped. And and I think also they there was a way in which people were able to deal with the impending suffering that would come with uh, th this journey. Uh, you know, the imprisonment that many of us faced, we found that our faith provided for us a place where we could be uh, uh, strengthened in a way, or a place where we could view the events, the circumstances that we were in through the lens of purpose, through the lens of necessity, that this these are some of the things we must go through in order for us to achieve achieve the kind of freedom that you know that we want um and and so i think i think i think that those were some of the positives that were that were there but also you know um it, it helped the movement grow in that when people of faith were being attacked for asking for example one of the protests that we did was asking people to pray for our nation and when people were attacked by the government for praying for the nation it just gave much more impetus for more people even to see the need for this kind of movement and other types of movement that were then born outside of uh, outside of what we uh, you know we had started so uh, i'll give that as an i'll give that as an answer 
Stephen, can I just advocate here and possibly maybe start a movement against you on this group uh, <laughs> by, ad by advocating for five more minutes so that we can hear one more question uh, here today. And feel free for those of you who have to go, I understand, just five more minutes and then and then we'll bring it to a close. Absolutely. Yeah, Cons Consuelo, if you're still here, would you like to ask your question? Oh, you're still you're still muted. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, hello, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. So uh, I was uh, given what Evan was saying in terms of being underground and then giving Joey's, uh, you know, fleeing the country. I'm wondering, and, and also Jamila's ex incredible experience with, um, you know, uh, years of experience with uh, Gene Sharp, working with Gene Sharp and also with other, talking to other activists. I'm wondering, is there a level of repression where you would never expect to see a mass public public movement and, and and that where people would be forced to go underground or flee even if it's temporary is there a level of repression where you think that that would happen thank you uh, i'll let joey do you want to go for that Sure, I can provide a few examples uh, from the context of Hong Kong, Tibet, and also mainland China, and then I can defer to Jamila to provide more expert answers to, to, the, to this one. So in the context of Hong Kong, we know that ever since 2019, we have got over 10,000 protesters who were arrested over uh, trumped up charges of participating in peaceful protests under the names of illegal assembly, illegal gathering, rioting, etc. And then in 2020, the, uh, the Hong Kong government and also the Chinese government introduced Use this draconian national security law in Hong Kong, where, uh, where for right now almost all of our pro democracy activists and leaders have been arrested and imprisoned, and they are facing a potential 10 year to lifetime imprisonment over, the, uh, over their participation in a civil society organized democratic primary election back in Hong Kong. And this level of mass political prosecution and also, uh, and also uh, charges really caused. Hong Kong pro-democracy actors and individuals to go underground given the very unreasonable and lengthy sentencing. And in the context of Tibet and also mainland China, we see that alongside these uh, mass persecutions and political oppression, we're also seeing at the same time a comprehensive all-rounded oppression and also killing of space within the society where we see uh, a, a, a complete media blackout, for example, in Tibet, where none of these foreign journalists or underground journalists are able to pass out any information from Tibet in regards to the, to the persecution of uh, Tibetan environment activists. And then in China, we see the persecution against various kinds of activists, including human rights lawyers, LGBTQ activists, um, feminists, labor organizers, and also religion practitioners. And we see that from all these mass persecution combined with media blackout and all these sorts of uh, surveillance and also control in all aspects of life, these kind of oppression really force people to go underground or even force people to put a pause in regards to their activism and also their movement. And that would be the examples that I can provide in regards to the real life ex examples in Hong Kong, Tibet, and also mainland China. And I know that time is running out, so I'll defer this to Jamila. Well, uh, I think that, you know, what we learned from the theory is that repression doesn't necessarily collapse movements, right? That in some ways, in, in, in some cases, it, it creates this backfire effect. Uh, effect. And, and I know you know this, Consuelo, and I, I know Yvonne uh, uh, mentioned it, that, you know, his arrest for arrest of leaders could end up, you know, have uh, built recruitment for for the movement. But we're looking at cases like Iran right now, where you're seeing like the like a, a major uprising, which seems to possibly have gone underground. That doesn't mean people have abandoned all activity. It means that they're likely strategizing and organizing and using these kind of loose networks of trusted groups to figure out next steps. Uh, that is very likely what, what what's happening there. And you know, uh, we also know that repression, you know, takes takes different forms and it isn't necessarily always the extreme repression of beatings and, and imprisonments. And in the case of Iran, we saw that, you know, thousands of people were arrested. Uh, many of them were sentenced to sentenced to death. Uh, however, very, very few of those sentences were actually carried out. So it wasn't the sentence itself. It wasn't the punishment itself. It was the fear of the punishment that caused the movement to, to go underground. So, so what's the lesson, right? I think the lesson here is that uh, there's a lot of repression that can be withstood by movements, uh, 
provided they have uh, you know, uh, 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 figured out how to do that. That's that's not easy, and and obviously diversifying tactics and using less risky methods is one way to do that. I know that wasn't quite your question, uh, but I think that to 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 I'm not sure if there's a sort of straight line between extreme repression and 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 you know the need to go underground. I think people uh, can op often operate in very um, yeah very sustainable ways uh, and 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 kind of carve out roles for people and and give people tactics to carry out even in context of extreme oppression. Stephen, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Yvonne, Jamila, Joey, it's, it's been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us and for guiding such a thoughtful and, is, and at times inspiring discussion. Um, and I want to thank everybody who was in the audience today. You have a lot of wonderful questions and, and resources shared in the chat. We appreciate those so much. Um, we hope you'll join us for future SNF Agora events. You can learn more about upcoming events on our website, www.snfagora.jhu.edu. And you can also join our mailing list to learn about SNF Agora's other programs. Just uh, click on the link in the chat. Uh, thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you again to you three. And we hope you all enjoy your afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.